All right, so welcome to this conversation again with uh, Karima Kerma, who... Thank you for having me again. No, of course. And of course, now you need no introduction because the last conversation we had was actually quite recently. Um, maybe it was a month ago, I think, something like that, where we were going into... I mean, we were discussing some philosophical topics, but then we were talking about general things you're interested in relating to antinatalism and, and also just about about you and your history. And in this video, we're going to be giving not an all-encompassing history of antinatalism, because that would take six hours, um, but we're going to do a sort of selected history, I guess, of antinatalism. And we're going to touch on certain aspects of antinatalist history that Kareem knows about, and there's some things that I'll chuck in there that I've sort of done some research on. Um, and yeah, I think this one's going to be really interesting for anyone who just wants a basic introduction to how antinatalism or proto-antinatalism, which we'll get into the distinction there, how that has manifested throughout history. Because um, I think that's super interesting. Um, very quickly before we start, um, I want to obviously mention a couple of books. The first being your, well, one of your books, Kareem, um, which is Antinatalism, a Handbook, um, it, that's in English and in German, although the German version is more, uh, it's larger, it's more extensive. Um, and if anyone wants to delve into a book that contains a lot of information about different people or um, ideas or groups in history that relate to antinatalism, that's a really good one to, to go for. There are a couple of other books as well. There's History of Antinatalism, How Philosophy Has Challenged the Question of Procreation by Katerina Lokmanova. Oh, she edited it. Um, then uh, Antinatalism, Rejectionist Philosophy from Buddhism to Benatar, which is written by Ken Coates. And then finally, or not finally actually, um, in the book by Masahiro Morioka, What is Antinatalism and Other Essays, Philosophy of Life in Contemporary Society, the essay that Masahiro does is called What is Antinatalism, Definition, History, and Categories, which also goes over the history. And now, finally, um, also there's The Child-Free Christ by Théophile de Guerreau, um, that goes into, that's more focused on Christianity um, and sort of antinatalism in Christianity and the history on that side of things. Um, so if anyone is really interested in this topic and wants to go away after this video and, and delve into it and do their own research and read more about it, those are some really good books to to start with. Um, before I ask the first question, Kareem, do you have anything you want to say before we kick everything off? If you like, uh, we can start right away. Thank you. Okay. So I already mentioned proto-antinatalism, and I think this is an interesting and important thing to discuss before we get into actually the history of antinatalism because a few people have made the observations and uh, am i right did you come up with the term proto-antinatalism at least i used it in lakmanwa's um book history of antinatalism mm. i guess i used it in order to to position the antinatalism of a person called koenig mm. no I'm sorry not not koenig because he's a downright antinatalist but in order to to well to to have a name for former antinatalisms, yeah. So, for people that may not be aware of this concept of proto antinatalism, what's the difference between proto antinatalism and antinatalism, and why did you feel it was important to coin a term to sort of define this distinction? Well, we have um, different. We actually have different kinds of antinatalism. We have full fledged antinatalism which appeared probably with um, said Koenig, a pseudonym. And we have also antinatalisms, in the plural, in the guise of religion, mm. which at that time were not full-fledged antinatalisms. So we can make a difference between the, at least these two types of antinatalism. If we take Schopenhauer, uh, we have a third type of antinatalism. His antinatalism was not in religious guise, but in the guise of a idealistic metaphysics. Mm. And 
how what is it about proto antinatalism that you think makes it not appropriate to term as fully fledged antinatalism is there sort of a chunk missing from it um there is a steady reference to for example god if we start if we endeavor to start in ancient egypt mm. some unbelievable so it may sound sound some 4000 years ago we find um accusations of god already in at a very very remote point in time mm. we find um a writer named ipuer he said um at our time already children are complaining he should he should not have created us he is not uh, the father but god of course right and it would be better if um if mankind disappeared from the surface of the earth um no creation no lamentation those are the accusations um some 2000 years before before christ always in uh in a religious guise then later on we have a, a different type of proto antinatalism in ancient greece um that type of antinatalism wasn't religiously overformed or overarched um the the exclamation i wish i had never been born or mm. would i had never been born allegedly is a typical excla exclamation in ancient greece um and um uh, it was self referring i wish i had never been born right yeah which is to say it doesn't necessarily apply to to all human beings mm. do you so just quickly going back to ancient egypt so it's interesting there that there was this reference of um he should not have created us right referring to god presumably does that mean that in the proto antinatalism that we that we can kind of see in in ancient egypt um and there may be more of it to be discovered is it the do you think it's the case that at that point there hadn't been this link between um the uh the fact that coming into existence is something that is regrettable and it's and there's a lack of it being linked with procreation there it's it's instead being directed at god rather than at the act of procreation or do you think i'm misunderstanding uh first of all i guess you just said something very important namely we need further research and scholarship i'm convinced the more scholarship and research we invest the more findings we will make mm. for example there are more ancient cultures than egypt we have china we have india and we need research from these countries or cultures cultures too um as far as i know um the egyptian writings were first and foremost lamentations and accusations mm -hmm. there appears to be a vast literature of god accusations and uh i puer for example appears to fall into the category of god accusations there were city lamentations when as after a city had been attacked and brought down uh by other emperors the the cities were lamented on and in the same manner um some egyptians seem to have uh, lamented the fact of the birth at the same time they presumably knew um that human beings are begotten mm. but they did not say yet we have to stop procreation it's our parents it was our parents mistake rather it looks like they always referred to some kind of creator mm. you know it's so interesting because obviously the 
the only things that are retained are the things that were actually written down. And even then, not all of it was retained, obviously, because, you know, it's probably the fact that over 90% of all the stuff that was written down back then is just lost and it's not going to be found and it's just worn away over time. So you you wonder, you know, this is what we can find in in the things that have been written down. What were the conversations that were being had there? Were they exploring these ideas in a way that, you know, in maybe maybe there were some small groups of people in somewhere like ancient Egypt that actually were speaking more along the lines of how we speak about antinatalism now, about linking it to procreation um, and, and making a sort of uh, ethical judgment about it. Um, and but it's just like none of that stuff was written down so we will never know if 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 that if those sorts of ideas were explored because we've yeah. only got the things that people yes. bothered to write down what we know though is that even before i Puer, um who must have written around 2000 before christ there was another writer who wrote perhaps um the first philosophical text his name is more or less ptahotep and uh, um, there aren't any remnants of anti-natalistic lamentations, but he said something like, um, old age has coming down, the world is becoming ever poorer, the world is deteriorating. And if it were possible to do more research around Ptahotep, we possibly would detect some other anti-natalisms. And uh, of course, we have to be aware of the fact that a lot of our findings depend on our on the structure of our interests. Mm. For example, I have a book which concentrates on on ancient Greece, and its authors are just passing by uh, the antinatalisms we find in ancient Greece because the structure of their interest is different from your and yeah. mine interests. Right. So something that they, they may see an antinatalistic line in some something written in ancient Greece, and they may think, oh, that's a strange sentence. But w we would actually look into the sentence and find out, you exactly. know, are there other cases exactly. of this, etc. But to them, it's just sort of yeah, a weird, are, interesting line yes. once. They're just looking for, in their book, for better never to have been, mm. and are yeah. doing so ignoring older findings and utterances in ancient Egypt. Yeah. And actually, before we go on, I quickly wanted to ask you something which maybe we should have covered right at the beginning, which is when when we're looking back, and this, and this especially applies to people like, well, like me, basically, who are, you know, individual people who don't have any particular expertise on looking back in time and understanding history and how ideas fit in different contexts in history. Right. Whereas some so a historian or someone who's who's very experienced this, very practiced at this, may be un, may you know may be more finely tuned in in how to understand something in the context. You know, something may sound antinatalistic, but it may actually it might not actually have those implications in the time yes, it was written. Yes. How careful do you think we need to be, or what tripwires do you think we need to be wary of as individual antinatalists looking back in time? And, and trying to research, research for ourselves? I guess we have to have multifaceted interests. We cannot restrict ourselves to, to analytical philosophy, to argumentation. We should not restrict ourselves to be it Christianity or ancient Greece. We have to be open-minded towards, as I said before, China, India, and... Uh, we also have to be aware of um, that um, we may have difficulty in detecting, as you said, antinatalisms, hidden antinatalisms, which only come to the surface as we as we gain and open a link to those long gone cultures. Mm. And I guess we also have to be wary of the fact that as antinatalists. Well, actually, this applies for many, many people. When you're looking back in history, especially if you're someone who believes in something which is on the fringe of society, it's nice to find people in history that think like you. And so we almost want to find 
well, obviously we want to find antinatalists in history. So I guess we also have to be careful about putting antinatalism in places where it actually wasn't and reading antinatalism into things where it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's move on to, do you have anything else to say on ancient Greece? One, how much do you know about the wisdom of, is it Salinas or Salinas? I'm not actually sure how, how it's said. Um, how much do you know about that? Because I know that's something that's often referenced when ancient Greece comes up. Yeah, he is, he is among the most, um, it's, a, it's a mythical figure. He appears in, in a writer, a poet named Theogenes, more or less, who probably lived around 600 before Christ, uh, centuries after, after um, the writers in ancient mm. Egypt. And um, he is famous for his saying, um, if we have to be born at all, it is always best to die young. And uh, apparently he, he and his intellectual environment influenced ancient Greece as a whole. Mm. Because there is a famous um, German or Austrian or Swiss historian, um, historian who wrote in German called um, Jakob Burkhardt. And he, in one of his books, tries to make an assessment of the general spirit of ancient Greece. We have um, the German poet Schiller, for example, who wrote many poems on the alleged positive um, ancient Greek spirit. According to him, there was only positivity. Mm. Being is good. But according to, according to, um, to Burkhardt, the general spirit and the general assessment of being in ancient Greece was negative. To exist was considered as, as negative. And according to him, many people were convinced if we have to exist at all, it is always better to perish early on. And mm. uh, of course, more research also is is needed on this utterance of of Burkhardt. Yeah, no, it's it's super interesting because actually one one thing that I have noticed um, is that I it it seems actually um, I don't know if I'd say uncommon, but when I look at antinatalism today and the things that are being written or the conversations that people have it seems like the mainstream discourse around antinatalism is the recognition that it would have been better never to have been and that creating other individuals is wrong. But the it isn't really attached to that, that once you're here, it is best to perish as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Th that, that doesn't, those two things don't seem to be connected, at least in the mainstream from what I can see today. But I've seen on, on, on many, many occasions looking back in history with several examples. You've just mentioned some, but we'll also get to Al-Mari. Al-Mari, it's very common for him to tie these two things together. We'll also touch on uh, Marie. Um, I'm going to get her second name wrong, but uh, who? Marie, um, yes, of course. Yeah. She, she also seems to uh, sometimes connect those two things together. Um, and it's interesting that that seemed to be quite common in history, but in the modern day, it doesn't seem to be. And I don't know if that is because in history, it was less formulated. And so it was produced from a general feeling of, of sort of a pessimistic judgment of the world. And so that sort of cluster of beliefs was found in individuals, whereas today, it seems like analytical philosophy is much more of a big a big thing. People think in a more analytical way, at least in the the sphere of antinatalism, and so we understand the nuance of passing these things apart and realizing that one doesn't necessarily lead to the other. Um, I don't know if that is the reason why there doesn't seem to be a strong connection today, but there was in the past. That was just a sense I got. But do, do you have any any thoughts on that at all? Um, yes, yes, definitely. I think um, it's also linked to the fact that um, 
modern science has neutralized our environment. Right. We yeah. live in a, in a neutral environment. We can um, ascribe neither positivity nor negativity to um, the world we live in. It's completely neutral. So that might contribute to to our to our existential feeling, which mm. differs from the ancient from ancient Greece. Mm. And uh, there are philosophers who tried to um, categorically capture the difference. And that, if, if, if I may, I would jump to the topic of Gnosticism, if that is, if that is okay. Yes, go for it, because I was actually going to take us on to there next. Anyway, oh, perfect. Um, uh, a German philosopher named Hans Blumenberg is convinced that modernity succeeded in leaving behind the Gnostical spirit. Let me try to explain what Gnosticism actually is. Mm. In my view, um, Gnosticism and Gnostic religions were the heyday of antinatalism. But mm. I must qualify it. Um, the heyday of antinatalism in the guise of religion. Yeah. Um, there were two um, mainstreams of Gnosticism. Um, one began with, um, the one founder was called Marcion. Marcion was born in what today is Tur Turkey in approximately 90 after Christ. And uh, he perceived the world as evil. And he asked, how is it possible that a presumably good God created a world in which there is so much suffering? Mm. And his solution to this riddle was, um, it cannot have been a benign God. It must have been a malevolent demiurge. Mm. A malevolent um, sub-God, if you like. And uh, I said, um, Gnosticism, the time of Gnosticism's reign was in the heyday of antinatalism. That is because his church, Marcion's church, became a fierce competitor of um, the, the actual established normal church. And there are scholars who say Catholicism became formed and established because it had to fight Marcionism. Right. And uh, they were antinatalists. Marcion even, Marcion even said, we have to annoy the regular God by not procreating. Mm. And let me try to, to explain in a few words the myth, the narrative which is behind Gnosticism. Um, Marcion and his followers uh, like Mani, who independently from Marcion created a huge church which reached, reached way into China for hundreds of years. Now, the, the narrative behind it is um, in the beginning, there was a transmundane God which did not mingle into our world. And for one reason or another, um, the spirit became enamored by matter and matter is evil. And when that happened, parts of the spirit, um, chunks of the spirit, sparks of the spirit became mingled with uh, matter. They are our, our best part. And as long as we procreate, according to Marcion and Mani, um, uh, the evil world will continue. Mm. And that is why he was in favor of um, an end of all procreation. And um, there are excellent books on, uh, on Gnosticism. The best one I've ever read is written by Hans, by Hans Jonas, and it's called um, The Call from the Alien God. Because Gnosticism, according to Jonas, is a religion of the call. There is a permanent call, um, directed towards us from a transmundane, transcendental uh, world, do not procreate in order to free um, 
the sparks of spirit inside you. According to Mani, who lived uh, a little bit later, he was born, I guess, in around 215 after Christ, who founded his church independently from, from uh, Marcion mm. and who um, experienced influences from Buddhism and other religions. Religions. Um, he lived in, in what today is, is Persia or Iran. Um, he also said, we have to free um, our spirits in order for it to return to uh, the transcendental God. And the culmination of the world process, according to the Gnostics, would be uh, an end of mankind. Mm. And now we have to become aware of the fact that this process, these religions were active for hundreds of years. Um, in one book I read that um, the last remnants of, of Manichaeism in China vanished only as late as in the 14th century, which is to say it persisted, it must have persisted for more than one millennium. Mm. And this, of course, um, gives hope for new discoveries. There must be traces. They must have left traces in many locations and in many cultures and cultural environments. In Put shortly, the influence of lived antinatalism, even though in religious guise, is enormous and underestimated. Mm. That's so interesting. So um, the Gnostics and Gnosticism is something that I've been meaning to research more and, and make a video around because um, just a bit of behind the scenes, I'm planning to um, start at some point in the next few months a... Uh, a series a bit like I do a series called antinatalism around the world where I talk to antinatalists in different countries I want to also start a series on um, antinatalism in history and do a video on each of these things so do a video on ancient Egypt do a video on ancient Greece and you know and I try to do as much research as I can um, uh, before it becomes unhealthy you know to, to an to a healthy degree yeah excellent. um and 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 put it into a video with all the links so people can can see it and stuff like that and i've already started on on a couple of them and one of the ones that i've really been looking forward to getting into is gnosticism because i've seen it referenced so much um and i just find it so uh interesting and i just wanted to ask something based off what you just said um about how some of these gnostic groups were able to persist for hundreds of years do you know anything about the mechanisms by which that happened? Because presumably if they didn't procreate, it wasn't through indoctrination of newborn children, um, unless they took other people's children and indoctrinated them. Um, and the reason I ask is one, because I, I, I would just be interested to know, but it's also that many people say, one, antinatalism is a trend, which, you know, doesn't seem to be it seems to be have been around for a long long time so it's not a modern trend but also a lot of people say well antinatalism will just select itself out of of the gene pool you know eventually it will just go away because if antinatalists don't have children then you know antinatalism will go away now in the modern day that seems particularly untrue because we have the internet so it's so much easier for information to be made available to people and to stay there but how did people that didn't have the internet and modern technology allow like facilitate their society or group or religion continuing for such a long time when they didn't procreate yeah very important question uh as for mani for example whose religion monkeyism stretched from what today is persia way into china and persisted for more than a millennium and he mm. early on was aware of um, the fact that he would have to spread the message. That is why he, he wrote a pamphlet, I guess, in easy words. And uh, he, um, he needed a grid, an organizational grid. And as well as Marcion, 100, some 150 years earlier, he divided his adherents in the more serious ones 
and the more accompanying ones. I guess mm. one of them was called Katechumini. And only the the serious ones were not allowed to procreate or chose not to procreate, in other words. And that is how they they persisted through history. Of course, of course, um they must have arranged to find a way to attract ever new followers. And uh, they were also um, attacked by um, by rulers because rulers need 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 soldiers, and obviously, Marcionism as well as Manichaeism um, would bereave uh, rulers of new soldiers. Mm. But somehow, for reasons we perhaps still have to investigate, um, the two religions, especially Manichaeism, survived for, for that many centuries. Mm. And you mentioned the book before, which I forget the name of. You said it was something about the alien god. Yes, the book is called, um, written by Hans Jonas, an expert, one of the world leading experts in Gnosticism. Mm. He died in, I think, in 91 or 93. And his book is called Gnosticism, The Call from the Alien God. And good, good um, as you mentioned it, because um, it makes me aware of um, a description of Hans Jonas. He says when he studied Gnosticism, he, he became aware of the fact that um, Gnosticism at its core it's, is like Heidegger, like Martin Heidegger's philosophy, because in Heidegger's time and being, there is a lot, a lot talk about man's thrownness into the world. And so it's not just um, a religion of the call, but also a religion of man's thrownness into an alien world. Mm. And uh, all, all of this reminded um, Jonas of, of Heidegger, who by no means was a, a Gnostic. And for him, for Jonas, it is proof that certain thought patterns or certain patterns of how we feel exposed in an alien world reappear through the ages. And that is, that is very important to notice because mm -hmm. it shows time and again that antinatalism is not alien in mankind's history. But it's a basic. It's a basic. It's a grid which reappears time and again, even though perhaps sometimes in different guise. Mm. But it's a constant. And, yeah, and that book is—is is it in English or is it in a different language? Is it? It is available in, in English, and uh, it's within reach. And here it is. Oh, can, great! Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, what I'll do is I will um I'll put a link in the description and then I'm going to get myself a copy of that as well so that I can uh read it for research. Uh, yeah, and let me also add it's it's worth reading it because it gives many insights into a into uh, the neglected widely neglected period of late antiquity and on top of that um it contains many 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 rewarding quotations which look as if they were written by today's antinatalists. Right. That's so interesting. And does it include the, um, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but the Manichaeans that in, uh, out in yes. the Far yes. East? Right, okay. Yes, it contains, um, it, there are treatises, treatises on the Manichaeans. Okay, that's so interesting. Um, okay, well, we're, we're going to have to move on because we've spent enough time okay. on that topic. But I like... Um, I'm looking forward to researching that video and putting something together. Um, so <coughs> one thing I, I wanted to move on to was Christianity. Now, I know Christianity is a big topic. And if people want to find out all the detail of how antinatalism sort of uh, manifests in, in Christianity, um, people can go and read uh, Theo's book that we mentioned at the start. Can you give a brief overview of how you see antinatalism manifesting in, in Christianity? Yes, of course. Some people would say um, it's just proto-antinatalism. Mm. But what kind of proto-antinatalism? 
in my mind, um, Christianity began to exist um, as a as a sub form of Judaism. In Judaism, which is to say, in the in the Old Testament, we find um, imprecations of being. We find it in Job and Jeremiah. Something like, I wish I had never been born, or I wish I had been stuck in my mother's womb and become a stone, for example. Mm. Those are self-referring antinatalisms. In Christianity, we find antinatalisms referring to the whole of mankind. Why? Because, because in or for the for the Christians, for the early Christians, um, the end was nigh. The end of the world was imminent, and that is an extremely important topic, because we have to ask ourselves, and they certainly asked, why procreate when the end will come, and um, um, heaven will come in a couple of in a couple of years, in 10, 20, or 30 years, because people at Christ's time were convinced mm. it won't be long. It won't be long. Um, the centuries passed, but if we look at some important figures such as Augustine, um, one of the perhaps the most important, most quoted church father, he still said, it's better if we do not procreate because why, fill, why should we fill the earth, earth um, with ever more um, lost souls, most mm. of which would would end up in in hell. So um, over the centuries, Christianity maintained its original vantage point on on creation, and some scholars would say it's um, it's a hidden it's a hidden Gnosticism. In Christianity, because overall, also Christianity, same as the Gnostics, had quite a negative view um, on our material being. Mm. The decisive point is Christianity um, grasp, grasped grasped um, the whole of humanity, not just not just single persons. Yeah. Sorry, did I interrupt you? I, I I finished. Thank you. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting one because so I am fairly ignorant about around the scripture um, uh, of uh, of Christianity, and so I may I'm speaking from a place of complete ign ignorance. But it, it seems to me that from a sort of zoomed out outside looking in perspective, it you can kind of quite easily see how antinatalism would fit into Christianity because there seem to be fairly obvious questions that you would ask someone who is a Christian of why would you bring someone into a fallen world who you know is going to be a fallen person with sin only for them to potentially end up in eternal damnation you know that that seems like a state of affairs which isn't completely welcoming to um, procreation being seen as a positive, if you get what I mean. Now, obviously, there are going to be quotations in the scripture and other interpretations of Christianity that people will put forward to say, actually, it's very pro-natalist or it's very welcome, welcoming to procreation. But it doesn't seem like you have to be an expert to understand why someone could see it as a religion that's not welcoming. Um, to the idea of procreation, um, I, don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on yeah, that. Yes, yeah, certainly you, you don't have to be an expert. Um, probably, with all probability, um, Judaism was much more in favor, much more pro procreation than Christ Christianity. Mm. But as Christianity has um, this aspect, or started in view of an imminent imminent end of the world. It had to be. It had to develop a negative view on human existence, mm. and only as men emancipated themse themselves from Christianity did they um, change their viewpoint on on our on our existence. There are later theologians who said. Um, 
it's 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 important not to create ever more souls because only a tiny fraction of the souls created will end up in heaven the vast majority will will end up in in hell mm. augustine and even luther called them the mass damnator the mass mm. is damned yeah yeah that's um yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's one of those things again where, I mean, obviously Theo has written a whole book on it, but it's one of those things where I guess the more time someone puts into looking into Christianity from an antinatalist perspective, the more stuff they're going to find, just like exactly. with so so many things. Um, one person in history I wanted to, and I've already uh, mentioned them, but I wanted to touch on um, is Almari. Um, now, I'll give a very brief introduction to Al Almari, and then I'll ask you what you know about him. So, for anyone that doesn't know, a very basic lowdown on Almari was that he lived around a thousand years ago in what is Monday Syria. He was, um, well, this is how I'm going to describe him. I I th I think he does fit these these at least two labels. So, he was an antinatalist. He was a vegan, and I see some people call him an atheist. I'm not sure if he was an atheist, but he was very skeptical of organized religion. Um, so he wasn't religious in the sense that people generally mean it, and he was very actually critical of organized religion. So he, he, you know, if you look at, so he was a poet as well, and and a philosopher, and. Um, if you if you read his poetry or at least the translations of it or if you know if you speak arabic then you can read it in in the original um in the original language although obviously i'm assuming the language has evolved somewhat since then so it's probably quite old fashioned arabic but um he doesn't hold back on his criticisms of of religion and you know he lived in an area where i i believe at the time islam was was the predominant religion so he often um sort of um lampoons uh sort of religious um figures and and religion itself um but another another interesting thing about him was that he wasn't a he wasn't like i was going to say he wasn't like some sort of isolated recluse but actually for most a lot of his life he was but he wasn't an isolated recluse that no one paid attention to attention to from what I understand, he was actually pretty well respected at his time, and he's actually quite well respected now as well. Um, he's seen as one of the great Arab poets, although a lot of religious, uh, or I guess specifically Islamic fundamentalists, um, really don't like him. So I believe in the Syrian civil war, um, there was a group which I am forgetting the name of right now. I forget which one it was. Um, went into his hometown and shot up and destroyed uh, some statues of him and some busts of him as, as a way to disrespect his his legacy, um, mostly because I think of, of his views that were critical of religion. Um, but also he was blind from four years old, uh, which is pretty impressive. And he lived to a very old age, so it's pretty impressive to be that influential um, and get to, the, get to those sort of advanced years at that time, whilst being vegan and antinatalist, etc., but also being blind for the whole time as well. Um, but yeah, what 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 is your knowledge of of Almari? Let me first of all admit, um, um, I should have noticed that Almari is around much earlier. Mm. When I finally read him, I was I was. Um, I was shocked in a positive way because I became aware of the fact I had missed out on somebody who was really important, who is a an internatalist miracle. Mm. When I got to know and finally read translations of Almari in an edition provided by, a, I, I guess, a British scholar named um, Nicholson, I was already familiar with um, Chayam, or Kayam is perhaps some yes, people would say. Yes, he's Egyptian, right? I guess he's Persian. Oh, he was maybe. born in what today is is Persia. 
but certainly, yes, Persian speaking rather than Arabic mm. speaking. I was familiar with um, Chayam, on whom I had written an essay. And uh, I was familiar with um, another poet called Attar, who had written a book um, which is called The Book of Suffering. But as you as you just um, explained, it is it is Almari who is um, who went to the core of antinatalism because he said in very clear words, um, rather than multiplying, it would be better if humankind disappeared from the face of the earth. Mm. And uh, he said so, even though he perhaps was not, according to Nicholson, an atheist, which makes things even more interesting. And you mentioned his statue was probably torn down by fanatics. We have to have in mind that when he lived around the year 1000, Islam was much more open-minded mm. than it is today in many regions of the world. Because we have a kind of we have a kind of triumvirate. We have Al Mari, the first one, we have Chayam next in the next century, and we have we have Atar. Um Chayam said something like um if we asked the unborn if they would like to come into our world, they would deny. That is extremely interesting and uh it's a reminder of um, John Rawls, who in his book, um, The Principle of Justice, tries to establish principles for justice by asking people, if you were unborn mm. and you had to decide where you want to be born or how the world is structured, would you tolerate billionaires? Would you tolerate um, extreme differences in income? Probably you, you would not because the vast, vast majority of people will be born as, as, as mediocre. And uh, before John Rawls, um, Chayam already had a good case in point. He said, no, listen, John Rawls, most people would have decided to never been born. And uh, same goes for Attar, who belongs to what I call the triumvirate, he said, um, if God had to create humankind at all, he should better have seen to it that he cares about our well-being, which he ob obviously does not do, which is why he wrote the book, um, uh, The Book of Suffering. Mm. Now, all the th three of them appear to be non-atheists, and they must have been very daring and audacious people to um, accuse their own God and the God in their in intellectual environment of of metaphys of, of crimes. Mm. They were um, metaphysical um, metaphysical um, rioters. What they did was a metaphysical revolt. And in my mind, Amari is the most outstanding person who committed uh, this um, metaphysical revolt in the Arab or yes in the Arab world who in part spoke Persian of course and uh, it's a period that deserves uh, much more much more research no doubt mm. yeah and um, I'll just say one last thing and then we can move on because I know we've still got a lot more to cover but um just for anyone that hasn't heard of Almari before and wants to get a sense of how open he was about his antinatalism, um, his grave is actually still in existence um, in Syria. You can go, well, I, you know, I'm not sure how easy it is to travel there, but um, uh, if in theory you can go and, and, and travel to it and see his grave, which is still there, and on his grave is written, uh, this is my father's crime against me, but I commit against no one or something to that effect. Um, which, yeah, you know, if 
if you want to, if like that's the sort of historical anti-natalist equivalent of sort of you know <laughs> like getting your dick out and slamming it on the table, basically, <laughs> you know, trying to make like a power move. Um, but um, yeah, so he didn't he didn't seem to shy away um, about expressing his view. Um, so should we move on to Immanuel Kant um, and the reversal of natal guilt? What what um what are your thoughts on that? Yes, we all have heard about Immanuel Kant, but very few people know that Immanuel Kant, in fact, asked why should people actually exist. He did not do it in books which um, many people do read, but he did do it in his Critic of Judgment, which is read by only few people. His Critic of Judgment is divided into parts. One part is a discussion, a long discussion about the question, are there any purposes in nature? And according to Kant, there are no purposes in nature, simply because our our understanding our mind doesn't allow for establishing purposes in nature. Now, many people would point to organisms and Kant says, well, organisms look like they are purposes because they are causes and effects in themselves. And they look as if they had been created by a demiurge, but in fact, they are not. We, do, we simply don't know what it is all about. This is an, 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 a very important topic. Kant also is a revolutionary. He says there are no purposes in nature, which means we don't exist purposeful. Kant even asked questions such as, which from, from, from today's vantage point would be considered as racist. He asked, we really don't know why uh, the people from the Tierra del Fuego, or why the new Hollanders do exist, because in his in his view, they had no culture, which of course, mm. which, as a matter of fact, is not correct. But in his time, they were considered as cultural as beings. And he said, human beings have to have culture in order to have a reason to exist. And now he, is conf he confronted himself with um, the question, why should we actually exist? And he says we have to exist because we have to unfold our, our meaning and we cannot do so as an individual. We need history and we need our species to unfold um, our meaning. Our meaning is to bring, to transfer freedom into this world. Kant had a divided world picture According to him, there is um, the realm of the trans transcendental, of which we do not know anything, except for it, allow it allows us for, for acting as free beings, and on the other hand, a determined world. And now, according to him, we had to, we had to persist and exist in order to realize as much freedom as possible, which sounds like, like an, empty, an empty prescription. And it is empty. And what is what is shocking about Kant, he had a very negative worldview. He said sentences like, um, we are not here to build huts on this um on this uh on this um theater of vanity, more or less. Mm. So his world picture was very negative, and nonetheless. He wanted us to exist, to procreate, and to exist into our future. And that is why I label him a dumbnator. Kant is one of the many dumbnators who had full in insight into, into our condition and who still wanted us to persist. But that's not all about Kant. In, his, um, in one of his books, he commits a metaphysical um, revolution in the forecourt of antinatalism. What he does is a reversal. He re reverts the natal debt. Mm. For millennia, uh, children 
We're taught you are indebted to your parents. We have brought you into existence. That is why you have to admire us and to be thankful. Kant reverted um, this idea. He said, no, 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 wait a minute. Um, you brought into being a person and uh, who could not have who could not have been asked if he or she wanted to exist. And that is why you are responsible. You are indebted, mm. and it's you who have to see to it that your child, at least until it becomes of age, until it's 18 or 21, probably at Kant's time, until he's able to to um, to find a job and and look for himself. And uh, there is appears to be a direct line from from Etar, from the Arab or Persian writer, Etar, who already said, if you have to create at all to the, to the omnipotent uh, creator, then you have to secure our well-being. And so mm. says Kant, if we procreate, we have to secure our children's well-being and we, are as, par we as parents are indebted to them and, and not vice versa, which is mm. revolutionary. And do you think, I mean, maybe I'm pushing this a bit too far. So push, you know, push back on me if, if you think that I am. But do you think that this reversal of the natal debt is, it, it signals a sea change in viewing existence from being a positive to being I don't know if it would suggest a negative, but at least something that comes with a burden. And the reason I say that is because if someone views the debt being with the child, you know, they're indebted to their parents, then this seems to me to have this a fundamental assumption that creating them was good and it was doing them a favor and therefore they owe something in return to their parents. Whereas if you flip it and say that the parents are indebted to the child, to me that suggests that what they have done to the child by creating them is in some way burdened them with something that they need to help to alleviate. And that burden could be something as simple as the child will now, you know, have certain duties or desires or needs that need to be fulfilled or catered to, um, or duties that need to be, you know, uh, carried out. These are all things that were put on that person without them asking to completely unnecessarily. It's, you know, there was nothing that was sort of, you know, compelling these people to to create this person. You know, there, there was there was no sort of moral force compelling them. There was no need to create them. Um, and, and, and so given that there's sort of that change in framing, it seems like it's it's framing existence or coming into existence as the putting of a burden on, on someone. Um, am I pushing that too far? Or do you think that that change in the direction of natal guilt does it, 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 it's founded upon this change in how we view coming into existence? Yes. Yes. According to Kant, probably bringing somebody into existence is a kind of imposition The metaphys metaphysics of imposition is difficult. I don't. I um, maybe we don't do not have time to discuss um, mm -hmm. the metaphysics and ontology of imposition. I have a different opinion on it. But um, according to Kant, certainly um, bringing somebody in, into existence is much more difficult than most people think. Also, Kant would say what we are doing is we are creating an entity outfitted with um, freedom, which is like a sanctuary for Kant, mm. because our only reason to exist is in order to, to realize freedom. But um, one could raise um, the question, why actually stop at um, the age of 18 or 21? But we can leave that maybe for, for later. Mm. Should we quickly touch on uh, Hegel's philosophy of existence? Um, what what do you have to say about that? Um, if we want to, we we could directly link Hegel and Kant. 
Okay. Because in his uh, philosophy of right, Hegel discusses Kant's um, Kant's um, categorical imperative. Kant's categorical imperative is famous, and uh, it's intended to give us to to give our deeds direction. But actually, it's empty. Always act in such a way that um, the maxim of your actions can serve as a law for everybody, more or less. Free translation. Mm. Now, Hegel says, Hegel complains in his philosophy of right, it's a completely empty device. And he says, he says, um, if we like, somebody could say, um, uh, it's my maxim, no human being should exist. And Hegel says, so, um, the human race would disappear. But according to Hegel, there is no contradiction in it. Kant's categorical imperative was meant in such a way that um, um, it's a device that shows us where we, where we become irrational. But according to Hegel, it's not irrational at all. So Hegel rejects Kant. He rejects um, Kant's cosmology, he rejects many parts of the Kantian philosophy, and he indirectly insists in our having to be. He also rejects um, extraterrestrials. Kant says in some part of his critique of judgment, extraterrestrials might be able on other planets to fulfill um, the goal of their, their species in the individual. So there would be no need for them to persist in the same manner as humankind has to on, on Earth. Mm -hmm. Now, Hegel says, um, for Hegel, we have to exist in order to establish freedom on ever more parts and regions of the world. And um, even though I don't like Hegel's outline of history, I think he can serve us, he can provide us with a tool how to understand history. Hegel says, um, first, there were only very few people free in China, in Egypt, in Persia, India. More people were free in Greece and Rome and in Christianity and the Germanic world. All of a sudden, everyone was free. And we, we could use Hegel's, um, Hegel's uh, viewpoint on history as a guideline in a way because apparently in Egypt, some people had gained insight into the fact that we have not to exist. Then apparently in Manichaeism or even before in ancient Greece, more people became aware of it in Manichaeism ever more people, even though under religious guise. And uh, roughly speaking, it looks like um, now there is an explosion of individual insights, thanks to the internet and to, um, to outstanding uh, programs as yours. Thousands, if not millions of people become aware of the fact we don't have to exist. And mm. that would be um, a Hegelian a Hegelian uh, viewpoint on on history. So rather than rejecting Hegel completely, we could and should perhaps use his his view on history as a as a tool. Mm. And what do you? Because um, I'm just conscious of time. I, I was going to move on to Karl Marx. So, what do you? Um, how, how do you think Karl Marx has any connection with, with antinatalism? I think we can follow the line established by Kant and Hegel and connect Marx directly uh, to it. Put very briefly, there is a very helpful met metaphor uh, developed by Marx. Marx speaks of um, the umbilical cord mankind's umbilical cord which by capitalism finally has been severed he labels it um, 
the umbilical cord of um, the natural nexus of the species. And apparently in Mark's time, humankind had become ripe for antinatalism as, as, as we know it. Marx lived from roughly 1818 to uh, 1883. And uh, it looks like we have finally cut the umbilical cord, which in former times um, connected us to uh, the species. And uh, also important with uh, Marx, he wanted to free every single human being and to make available to all of us um, the richnesses developed in our history. Mm. But he never says why actually we have to exist and why we should continue with um, humanity. So that is um, how we could link and uh, link Marx to the line coming from Kant via Hegel. Mm. And in my notes, you say here that antinatalism is is in a way um, being less utopian than communism. What did you mean by that? Yes, perhaps. Perhaps because um, every one of us can do what is necessary to um, realize antinatalism's final, ga final, final goal. Whereas as for communism, you can be a good person, you can be a social person, you can make many sacrifices, but still not necessarily you do all you can in order to make socialism or communism come real. But by not having kids, you've done the utmost in order to realize antinatalism's final goal as predicted by Almari, for example. Mm. Okay, no, that makes some um, that makes sense. Let's um let's talk about Koenig. Now before we get into Koenig, um I want to say to anyone watching that we're only going to briefly go into Koenig because um without revealing too much, but um there will at some point soon in the next couple of weeks um or the next month be a full discussion on Koenig. Um, coming up so there's going to be much more detail to come um, so we're just going to go into Koenig sort of surface level but can you give a brief introduction to um, who is Koenig what contributions has he made to antinatalism and what is this what is the current situation in terms of researching Koenig yeah, Koenig is, um, is a pseudonym. It's not his real name. Um, a bunch of people here in Germany, Hamburg, are still trying to uh, find out who he really was. It's not me, but somebody else who's, who's a specialist on that. And uh, all we know is um, he must have lived in Germany in the Neckar region and appears to have to have had many connections to, to France. Um, apparently, he also wrote in French. He must have been fluent in French. And uh, there are con traces of contacts to a certain Madame Huyot, which you mentioned before, mm. also an antinatalist we will not discuss right now. And uh, for me, Koenig is the first full-fledged antinatalist. Interestingly, there is a book written by a Frenchman named uh, Ranzin, and uh, there, there are some bibliographical traces on Koenig in his book, and interestingly, Ranzin in his book names Koenig an antinatalist. He says he is an antinatalist. Um, Ranzin's book was written in 1980, so here we have um, an early early appearance of the word, the word antinatalism, in today's in today's meaning. Now, what does it mean? The first the first full fledged antinatalist, um, a full fledged antinatalist, in my mind, is an antinatalist that is neither gnostic nor 
religious, nor does does he defend an idealism or a metaphysics such as Schopenhauer's. Mm. But um, he adheres to to a modern world picture that is reigned by what science can can explain. That is um, that is Koenig. Um, it's um, Schopenhauer and Gnosticism without religion and without metaphysics of the will. Mm. And what is the current situation when it comes to research on Koenig? What are the key things we don't know about Koenig? What are the things that you suspect suspect we may discover um, in the in the coming years? Um. He has left, apparently has left very few traces, but he received many letters. For example, he distributed some of his pamphlets among French teachers, and there are hundreds of responses of those teachers and other readers collected. So if we manage to step into his apparently vast correspondence, we sooner or later should be able to find out who he really was. Mm. And uh, I guess there must be a larger correspondence of Madame Eos. So mm. if we were able to find a collection of her letters, we might um, find uh, disentangled Koenig's real name. But apart from that, maybe it's not that important to know how who he really was. What is more important is to um, to garner all his writings. We have uh, a couple of his writings. He also wrote under different pseudonyms such as Quartus. And uh, let me just um, show you a funny thing, if I manage. Uh, I read, um, recently I read a book on Uh, nihilism, and I read on um, this title, La Provocation Cunique. And I thought it reads like Koenig, the provocation Koenig. So maybe he chose his name Koenig in order to establish a link between um, the philosophy of ancient Diogenes, who in French is addressed as as Kynik. And right, so maybe there are links um, between between Diogenes philosophy 400 before Christ, who also was an ant antinatalist and, and Koenig. Yeah, that's, um, I'm just, <laughs> I know, I know that there's um, sort of, uh, you know, a, a more in depth discussion coming up in the future. So I don't want to go into it too much now. But um yeah, I'll leave my I'll leave my questions for for another time. But Perfect. Koenig is definitely, um, I think, in terms of promising research into antinatalism in history, Koenig is is one of the sort of um, the the big sort of frontiers of of antinatalist research into in, into trying to discover what antinatalism was like and yeah who were antinatalists in history. So he's, it's going to be super a, interesting. He's a heavyweight, but we might already have discovered his um, most important works. Perhaps mm. he didn't publish any further um, side works. Who knows? Mm. But definitely, the as we begin to learn more about his connections and the people he corresponded with, we may then find other people who were thinking about these ideas and wrote about these ideas, like um, Marie uh, Uyo. 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 Um Cool. I've heard you mention in the past as well, a, I believe uh, they, were, they were French, or I, actually, I may be still alive, Anaba? Yes, yes. So who who is that, and what contributions have they made to... Um, to antinatalism, or as we should call it, maybe anti procreationism. Yes, exactly. I, I butchered that anti procreationism. Yeah, yeah. Annabar is um, is uh, a French person, 
he I guess he's still alive. Our email exchange reaches back some fifth to some 15 years ago. His real name is no secret. His real name is Philip Bellot. He is um, the author of an antinatalist novel, which is available only in French, as far as I know, but mm. it's still available. And uh, um, a couple of years ago, he published a book in which he says, um, you are still laughing at my anti anti-procreationist um, imprecations I started 40 years ago. Which is to say, um, when we were almost not born, he already was an antinatalist or an anti mm. anti procreationist. And uh, I thought about the difference or possible differences between the term antinatalist and anti procreationist. And apart from the fact that anti procreationist is difficult to pronounce, it has some advantages. Namely, mm. what we actually want as antinatalists, we we don't want to to procreate. We don't. We urge people not to beget. Mm. Whereas antinatalism refers to birth. But if we have to talk about birth, it's already too late, because um, once. Um, people have begotten a child, it would have to be aborted. Whereas in the term uh, anti-procreationism refers to, to the fact, do not procreate in the first place. Mm. Presumably it's too late now and antinatalism is established, but um, we should, uh, I, I think um, Anaba alias um, Philip, Phil, Philip Bilot deserves um deserves some some credits and mm. his research his research into the history of antinatalism is very interesting and fruitful for example he mentions a job the the job from the old testament mm. and says there was a sumerian job well before the job which we know and uh, he also is um the author of neo-gnostical poems whose mm. content is, is is very recent, which is to say he mingles everyday experience from his lifetime into a gnostical worldview, which is very, very rewarding, if you like. Mm. And just a couple more questions on on um on Philip. So does is any of his work in English, or is it all in French? As far as I know, it's it's only it's only in French. And do you know if he speaks English? Unfortunately, I have I have no idea. I have no idea. But I guess as a journalist who published in some of the most important uh, papers in France, he will at least be able to understand French uh, English. Yeah. And do you, do you know how how old he is now? Uh, there are or there used to be videos on the net, and uh, I guess he's no older than maybe seventy five. But let me see if I can establish his his age right now. No, it's not mentioned. It's not mentioned here. But I guess he's not older than seventy five mm. at most. Mm. Okay. No, that's that's um that's interesting. Thank you for that. Um you've also mentioned um Hans Jonas and here I've got the godfather of pronatalism and the nemesis of gnosticism's antinatalism. What did you mean by that? Yeah. Um we talked Jonas before because of his book um on Gnosis, mm. the call of the alien god and it looks like later on Decades later, Jonas somehow regretted his having been inspired and fascin fascinated and lured away by Gnosticism. Mm. So he wrote um, the book, um, The Principle of Responsibility. 
And most people read it as, an, as a purely ecological book about the ecological crisis. We are responsible vis-a-vis -vis nature. Whereas in reality, uh, Jonas' books on responsibility is a book on the imperative of humankind to continue its existence. And how does he argue? Well, he leaves behind Kant's insight. There are no purposes in nature, according to Kant. Jonas contradicts. He says, um, there is at least self-affirmation in nature. Organisms are self-affirming entities. And uh, he goes on saying, we are products, products of nature. And there is continuity in nature, according to Jonas. Mm. So we are, according to him, we are wanted. Whereas Gnosticism always says we are not meant to be in this world. Jonas tries to establish the insight we are meant to be in this world. Somehow he must have noticed the weakness of his argumentation. Jonas, I must tell you, has been lambasted by analytical critics because many of his argumentations do not hold water. And as a last resort, he moved on to, or back perhaps, to theology and says, even if we wanted to disappear by means of abstention from procreation, Mm. We must not uh, let God down, and we would let him down should we should we should we die out. That is in a very small nutshell, Jonas' ontology, with um, ontology being um, a doctrine that is occupied with beings' most basic structures. According to Jonas, there is purpose in nature. He even inverts the Gnostic call. There was a call from the transmundane, transcendental God in Gnosticism. Jonas says there is a call um, in nature which reaches us and which says you have to persist, you have to remain in existence as a human race. And he tries to give us an example. His example is striking. He says, um, my best proof is um, the cry of the newborn because it is a helpless being. And referring to the newborn, Jonas tries to jump from being to ought. Mm. I must add, um, it's an established basic in modern philosophy. There is no continuity from being to ought or to you must act in such and such a way. Jonas does. He says, crying the newborn um, addresses us directly and we must help. And uh, the newborn is only the utmost purpose for being in nature. There are other calls directed towards us. And that is why we have to exist. The newborn is telling Jonas does not say there are countless um, old, frail, and decaying people lying about in old people's homes. Not at all. Quite, quite contrary, he even says um, he even says um, old people have to make place to recede in order for young people to be able uh, to occupy their places on our planet. So mm. after all, also Jonas, similar, similar to Kant, is a damnator. He wants us to continue at all costs. He even tries to reconcile Auschwitz, uh, humanity's um, biggest crime, to my mind, with our continued existence. He says uh, we have to prepare to future atrocities, but we must continue to exist. In my eyes, um, uh, Jonas is one of the biggest damnators in the history of philosophy. Mm. 
And the final note I've got here, and then I've got a few um, quick questions I wanted to ask you at the end, is antinatalism and politics, a quest for um, an, uh, a universal basic income, basically, or an unconditional basic income for all humans due to our being thrown into existence. What did you have to say about that? Yeah, um, some people are mulling over, are there any connections between anti antinatalism and politics? I, mm. heard, I heard about a political party uh, founded in Great Britain some a couple of years ago, yeah. Yeah. which shows them um, that there, there are some, some links. Now, um, also in Germany, there are ongoing discussions of whether, whether or not there should be a universal, universal um, unconditional income. And uh, the idea actually reaches back to to Attar, the Arab philosopher, who said, um, "If we have to be created, um, somebody has to see to our well-being." And same with um, Kant, who also said, um, "It's the parents' responsibility to take care of us." Now. Parents cannot always take care of their children. Some parents, many parents, most parents would be overburdened. And at the same time, um, I for one cannot see why we should stop at the age of 18 or 21 when we provide um, necessary things uh, to, to young pe for young people. So it is um, the state who is responsible actually most or all states are pronatal most states uh, want to to make their populations larger except for china in a short during a short period of time so actually it's um, the state's duty to offer newborns an unconditional lifelong income and i guess we can derive this the claim for this income if we look at the history of antinatalism with um, etar and emmanuel kant as mm. um, main thinkers mm. you know it would be really interesting to have a discussion about antinatalism and politics and what just you know how could antinatalism inform government policy? Um, it would be really interesting. Maybe, maybe I'll try and put something like that together. I'll have to think about who yeah. to involve, but I think you'd be a really good person to involve on that. Um, you know, talking about if we were to put together, um, it, or it, if an antinatalist party were to be put together, um, what sort of policies would it um would it have what would it strive for um and it would be yeah that would be a really interesting discussion to have um but for another day um so i quickly wanted to ask you a few final questions the first one was i don't know if i've made this up but um i've got on my notes here that you've given some lectures about antinatalism mm -hmm. um what what were those lectures? What settings were they in and how were they received? Well, in the mid-90s, I was um, giving seminars at the universities of Hamburg and Leipzig. And one of my Leipzig students invited me to um, the Leipzig um, church parish. And I gave, uh, indeed, I gave an, a lecture on antinatalism in front of mostly religious people believe it or not i was it mm. was well received uh there was no unruly behavior i wasn't lambasted um people used to be very polite and were asking polite and uh well informed informed questions mm. and uh, the same goes for my seminars which i didn't post as seminars on antinatalism, but rather as seminars on future generations, for example. So right. in the guise of uh, future gener generations, I managed to discuss some antinatalist topics. And it was mm. well received by, by the students. 
And I must say, I never experienced any any problems as regards my my seminars at Hamburg and Leipzig University. No, that's good to hear. And the the one that you gave to a religious audience, did you tailor how you presented antinatalism to that audience? Did you talk about the more um, religious side of things, or did you just give a general talk about antinatalism? Uh, as far as I remember, I stepped directly into the advantages of antinatalism. I confronted the audience with um, the fact that if we if we keep on procreating, there will be wars in future. Mm. And I added, there is a very simple device to prevent any future war or any future collapse of ecosystems, any future suffering just by abstention from procreation. Mm. Then, of course, people started talking about sexual drive and so on. And I said, um, wait a minute, contra, uh, contraceptiva are not as old as mankind, but thousands of years old. So if people want to, they know how to prevent um, procreation. Mm. And in um, in Germany, in Hamburg, you've had some antinatalist meetups as well, in person meetups. Um, and I, I, you know, that you continue. There's one coming up, so that you, you know, you continue to have them. What what are those um, What are those meetups like? What what sort of things do you do? Do you host discussions on certain subjects, or how how have those been? Uh, People who, particip who participate in those meetings come from all walks of life. Some are not even antinatalists. We try to determine topics to discuss um, in the next uh, for the next meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, we are open to any to any participants and to to any topic as long as it's um, widely related to to antinatalism. For example. We're going to to discuss um, the topic of extraterrestrial intelligence, and uh, we try to make it not academic because um, it should be accessible and understandable and interesting for for everyone. And mm -hmm. we also want to encourage people to bring in their personal experiences. As it is not not academical, people are welcome who have made personal observations, who have behind them a personal history uh, of antinatalist convictions, and so on. Mm. And my final question, because I know we've been going for just over an hour and a half now, um, is what are what are your personal future plans surrounding antinatalism? Um, Are you working on anything at the moment that people can look forward to in the future? Do you have any big projects coming up, or are you working on several small projects? What What are your What are your general future plans for antinatalism? Um, I'd like to elaborate more on a topic uh, which is um, philosophical anthropology and antinatalism. Philosophical anthropology is perhaps not internationally known, at its core is um, an insight developed mainly by German philosophers of um, the last century. They say man by nature is a cultural being. Mm. And uh, Karl Marx, whom we discussed earlier today, actually belongs uh, to this tradition because he says we have severed the umbilical cord of um, the species. And now I think um, the, the idea that from, from, the, from the beginning, from by nature, we are cultural beings is even more rewarding because if we are cultural beings, we cannot wait until... Um, um, a terrestrial disaster or a cosmic disaster um, ends uh, 
the existence of our of our race. But as cultural beings, we have to see to it to end our history on our own um, in a cultural way, in a cultivated mm. way. So I'm trying to figure out how to elaborate on these insights. And I have some uh, thinkers who contributed to uh, these ideas. Let me also add, if I may, um, we are actually experiencing um, a second wave of antinatalism. The first wave um, consisting in those centuries of Gnosticism, when millions of people must have been inspired by antinatalistic thoughts. And uh, we are about to establish um, by means of mass communications and people like you, a second huge wave of um, antinatalism, mm. which hopefully one day will be second <laughs> to none. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, um, it's an interesting way of, because I think referring to it as a second wave is interesting because I think even a lot of antinatalists will not realize how much antinatalism there is or proto-antinatalism there is in history and so referring to it as a second wave you know built into that there was a first wave which i don't think many people realize they think well antinatalism yeah sure maybe isolated people here and there thought this in in the past but because of modern communication this is really the time where it's been able to flourish not realizing that it has flourished in the exactly. past um so yeah, I, I just I'm very much looking forward to learning more about antinatalism in history myself, but also seeing what as we discover more and as more people work on this, seeing what comes out of that. Um, that's going to be super interesting. But yeah, Karim, thank you so much. Again, I want to remind people if if they want to look more into antinatalism in history, a really good place to go to is your book, Antinatalism, a handbook. There will be a link in the description along with I will try and collect links to everything we've spoken about, but I'm I'm not going to be able to, you know, it's it's not I'm not going to be able to find links for every single thing we've mentioned, but um, I'll try and put as many links as possible. And as I said before, I'm going to try and develop this series about antinatalism in history, where I sort of do a video focusing on on each part. Um, but that you know that will be a big project into the future so that that will be something that will happen over a number a of lifelong years lifelong project yeah exactly um but it's one i'm i'm looking forward to and and have already started as well but um yeah i just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on a second time thank you so much lawrence